and I will be splitting my time with the speech uh, with the member from Beauport Le Malou. So, Madam Speaker, the, the motion before us today reads as follows that the Prime Minister broke his promise to eliminate the deficit this year, and that perpetual and growing deficits lead to massive tax increases, that the House call on the Prime Minister to table a plan in Budget 2019 to eliminate the deficit quickly with a written commitment that he will never raise taxes of any kind. This is a very reasonable motion that has been put forward by the Shadow Minister of Finance in, in our party, the Conservative Party, because it speaks to the responsibility that we have as parliamentarians to be wise stewards of taxpayer dollars. I want to briefly outline why the Prime Minister's broken promise on deficits is so important to Canadians and why they should be concerned about it and why these deficits will undoubtedly lead to higher taxes under this government and why it's so important for my colleagues across the way to, you know, to, to look away from the Prime Minister and say what is in the best interest of their constituents is to bring the deficit down significantly, to work back to balance and to not raise taxes on Canadians. So first of all, let's talk Madam Speaker, about the Prime Minister's broken promise. In 2015, the Prime Minister made the following promise to Canadians, a balanced budget in 2019, and from the Liberal platform, modest short-term deficits of less than $10 billion in each of the next two fiscal years, and a balance sheet with a debt-to-GDP ratio of 27%. So where are we today on those promises? after, of course, the Prime Minister famously said the budget would balance himself, so the, itself. So they, they, they had these three promises in the 2015 campaign. Their management approach was the budget will balance itself. My, my colleague has asked many times when the budget will balance itself, and we haven't heard an answer. But this is where we're at today. The finance department itself, so the government's own public servants, has said that there will be no balanced budget until at least 2040. At least 2040. That's, you know, 40 some years from now. That is really irresponsible to not even have a target on when we're getting back to balance. Um, the amount of debt just on the current course that we're in, never mind having to deal with future issues or whatever, is that this Prime Minister will have added an additional $271 billion worth of debt to our country. Of course, this comes on the fact that the Prime Minister, when he came into government in 2015, inherited a balanced budget right. from the former Conservative government. So, in October, just in, of this year, in time for the 2019 election, or might be earlier, we never know, with Liberals, Liberals have added over $75 billion of debt that in that short period of time. So, of course, this is very clearly, they've clearly broken their promise. And the debt to GDP ratio, it will be around 30.5% in October. So they've increased that as well. So why is this so important? Well, first of all, you'll notice that a lot of Liberal cabinet ministers or parliamentary secretaries, when they stand up in question period, they stand up and use something as a success metric that no small business owner, that nobody in a household would use as a success metric. They stand up and say, we have spent X amount of money. So rather than say, like when we ask a question, how are you going to solve this problem? They say, we have spent X amount of money. They don't talk about actually fixing the problem, they just talk about spending money. And that's because liberals don't understand that spending money is not a metric of success in government. It's something that we need to actually be very wise about when we spend money. So. The problem first with this deficit is that Canadians don't really have anything to show for all that debt that the Liberals have incurred on their behalf. I mean, I look in Calgary and I don't see the green line that we committed to in the former government under the context of a balanced budget built. The only infrastructure that's really been built under this government uh, was the then infrastructure minister's office renovations. I think it was about a million dollars uh, for his office renovation. 
I mean, what this government has done is expanded the size of government just to, for the sake of expanding it, not to help Canadians. So that's a problem. Canadians are spending money and not getting anything out of it. But somebody has to pay for this at some point, which is why this government will absolutely raise taxes on Canadians, because they're, they're seeing this massive debt increase. They're expanding government. They have ever-increasing costs of so many different things without the results. But what's happening is that the economy is not going to be resilient. It's not going to be competitive. And so when the economy constricts or re retracts, we actually start seeing what? A decrease in government revenue. So you have the Liberals increasing expenses for no reason and ma racking up massive deficits, putting in place very negative scenarios for economic growth over time, which means that there's a high probability that government revenue will decrease. So how do you get more money? If you're not going to decrease your expenses and you're not going to increase your revenue through economic growth, it's, well, what's what? It's taxes. So this is very, people should be concerned about the deficit because they are going to have to pay every single Canadian through increased taxes for this prime minister's mistakes. And the mistake is the deficit, this promise that he broke to Canadians. So let's talk about competitiveness for a sec. While the, our, our major trading partners to the south and, and other parts of the world have been trying to put in place competitiveness aspects, so reducing red tape or actually reducing regulatory, unnecessary regulatory burden, but, or lowering taxes, we've been increasing those things. So what what do we see in Canada? We see talent and capital leaving Canada to invest in more competitive jurisdictions. So that's a problem for the revenue side, which is going to precipitate a need for more taxes, right? So again, that paying for, just for the Prime Minister's failures. But over time, that lack of competitiveness that lack of competitiveness, that actually makes, and these, these, these increased deficits, they make our government less ability, less able to withstand shocks if we have a major economic incident, as we saw in 2008, which we were able to weather with targeted short-term infrastructure investments and then a return back to, to budget, uh, balance in 2015. What the Prime Minister has done is at a time, like he inherited a balanced budget, he inherited a very strong performing economy, and he spent, he, the, the campaign narrative was now is a good time to borrow money. But he didn't talk about why or the need to, to go into deficit at that situation. If, if we're actually going to be less resilient, the government is going to be less able to spend in the future if we have these massive debts, and why? Because the more debt you have, if you have a credit card bill, you understand this, the more interest payments you have, right? The higher amount of debt you had, the more you pay in interest. And the government of Canada has to pay interest on its debt. So the more that we have to spend, the more taxes that we have to collect, or that the Prime Minister has to collect, to pay down the interest on his deficits means that they can't spend money on things like infrastructure, like the Green Line in my riding of Calgary. So you've got this massive problem that this government has created by their deficits for no reason policy, by adding all of this debt to, to, the, Cana to the Canadian uh, government and to the Canadian people. And it's, it is going to result in higher taxes. And that's why we put forward this motion today, Madam Speaker. It's just for government members to have an opportunity to say, you're right, we need to stop this. And all Canadians shouldn't be in a position where they're having to pay for this Prime Minister's mistakes. Oh, and Madam Speaker, I think we've got a lot of ample evidence now to find out that the government, that the budget actually won't balance itself. Thank you. Member for Whitby. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I want to thank my honourable colleague for 
her speech, uh, she mentioned that, you know, we don't have anything to show for the investments that we've made in Canadians and we're, you know, Canadians are not going to get anything out of, out of it. This is a direct quote from my honourable colleague's speech. Um, I think what Canadians have seen and will see, Madam Speaker, is we have the lowest unemployment in 40 years. We have the strongest growth in uh, the G7 countries. Uh, Canadians, through, with our investments, have been able to, uh, we've been able to create the conditions where 800,000 new jobs have been created by Canadians. Um, this, this actually helps to build resiliency, um, Madam Speaker. In addition to that, to help our, our businesses grow and expand and export, we are the only G7 country with trade agreements with each of the other G7 countries. In fact, we have uh, 14 um, trade agreements. In terms of competitiveness, LNG, mega projects, largest investment uh, of $40 billion. We decrease red tape for, for small businesses. Canadians could clearly see that our investments are working on their behalf, and this government is working on their behalf as well. Here. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, I think it's kind of brave for my colleague opposite to stand up and talk about unemployment to a member from Calgary because of the environmental policies and the regulatory policies which do nothing to affect the to improve the environment in Canada but just kill jobs in my riding. In my riding, Madam Speaker, we went from about the natural rate of unemployment to nearly double digit unemployment under this government. So spare me on 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 unemployment figures and job growth. Seriously, come on. In terms of uh, any of the the, uh, the 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 investments should she talked about? There was there's nothing material there. I mean, there, Kinder Morgan was prepared to invest seven billion dollars into the Canadian economy, and this government went and used tax dollars to to pay for something that private industry was prepared to invest in, which still is likely not going to see this grow. It's this has to stop. There is nothing to show for this outside of increased taxes. You know, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on people who are legally crossing the border at upstate New York. And so one of my colleagues was here made a good point. How many, how many more government positions have been padded on those employment figures? Government doesn't create... Unfortunately, I do have to allow for other questions. I did mention a while ago that uh, we need to keep uh, it a little bit short during the questions and comments. Uh, questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, uh, through you to the member, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank her for visiting my riding uh, last week. I hope she's spent lots of money supporting the small businesses during her time there. Uh, but I have to ask a question, because the Opposition Day notice says uh, a, a written commitment that they will never raise taxes of any kind. And, as the member knows, there's a growing disparity between the really rich in Canada and the rest of us. And I'm wondering if she's saying that that means that we should never raise taxes on the wealthiest Canadians or wealthy corporations. And what does that do for the middle class? Uh, the Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Well, under this government here, tax records actually show that the wealthiest Canadians, the ones that have revenue higher than $140,000, pay $4.6 billion less in taxes under this government. So, you know, I'm just looking at it from the perspective of my riding and the people who ask me to fight for them on a daily basis. They know that under both the Liberals and the NDP, they're going to see increased carbon taxes, small business tax increases, payroll taxes, EI premium increases. Everything is tax, 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 tax. Like, nobody in this place outside of the Conservative Party ever stops to ask and say, like, well, why are we spending this money? Why are we forcing Canadians to bear the brunt of our spending here? And that's a principle that we need to get back to. And I think it is fair for the Parliament to consider that request, to say we should have a written commitment to not raise taxes. I, I mean, that would create certainty. It would create invest an investment climate for growth. And frankly, Canadians need that news. They need some good news for once after the years of tax and spend politics that they're just tired of under both of these leftist parties. Order. It is my duty, to, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 38, to inform the House that the questions to be raised tonight at the time of adjournment are as follows. The Honourable Member for Essex, International Trade, l'Honorable Député de Saint-Hyacinthe-Bagot, La Santé, and the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan, Foreign Affairs. 
Resuming debate, reprise de débat, l'honorable député de Beauport, les Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci, chers collègues.